CityCast from Explicity. It must have been seven or eight years earlier. I was not yet at school when my mom took us to Sazak to show the house she was born and raised in. Like all the stone houses watching the sea from the hilltop, its doors and windows had been plundered. It was blue, she mumbled. The door was blue, as blue as the sea. Daddy had painted it with chilies. Our village had been founded here on this hill to protect it from the pirates so they wouldn't raid the village or kidnap its people. Daddy loved the sea. He had painted our door blue so he had feel closer to it. Look, the sea has come to our door, he used to say. She had pointed to the purple silhouette on the horizon in answer to my where are the people of this village. I have never forgotten her silent sniffling sobs. That day, my mother had virtually turned into a little girl my age, dragging us behind her as if we were playing house, in and out of houses through absent doors, and catching up with the phantoms of absent neighbors lingering in the ruins. My next visit to Sazak was last year. This time, it was my nana who was prepared to walk for hours just to see her old village once more in this lifetime. As she had wandered amongst the ruins, that old woman had grown younger in contrast to the village that had grown older. It was like being in an ancient town where people had lived long ago, but it hadn't been centuries, only years. The roofs were gone, looking for the gold supposedly buried by the rams, treasure hunters had dug holes everywhere, even bored in the hearts and taking chimneys apart to see if there was anything hidden there. It was like every memory and all that had gone had perished under a massive landslide. The church roof was missing too. Your school's roof was repaired with the ties taken from our church, Nana had said. Of course, your school used to be a church too. I may have found it strange that she would lay claim to the infidel's church as our church but had bitten my tongue all the same. Her brimming eyes had scanned the terraces invaded by scrap. No vineyards, no market gardens left. It's all ruined, she had sighed. Her voice trembled as we approached their house, with faltering footsteps apparently reluctant to face reality. She murmured breathless prayers, stepping in with a besmele to be greeted by a fig tree in the middle of the house. The crickets fell silent and a great, big lizard slithered away to hide under a rock. Nana moved slowly, mourning along with her memories, aged palms stroking the stone walls in a blessing. She too wept in silence like my mom. I don't recall how long we stayed surrounded by the four bare walls of the home she was finally reunited with 20 years later. She told to herself from time to time and cried from time to time. She would never have gave up unless I'd said, Nana, let's go now. It will get dark. Hello everyone and welcome to the Literary City Season 4. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of our journey. My guest today is an author from Turkey, Ferhat Sunel. He is a career diplomat and he is currently the Turkish ambassador to India. Ferhat is a demonstrably fascinating novelist. His latest novel, The Lighthouse Family, is a wonderful example of storytelling, of craft, and really of everything literary. Now, I'll venture to say without qualification that it is one of the best novels I have read in recent years. Because this novel embraces a universally resonant human sentiment, it makes it relatable across cultures, to anyone anywhere, even if the story it tells 
is set deep in rural Turkey. This distinctive trait, being inherently ethnic within the text, yet possessing an international uh, resonance in a broader context, defines the essence of what is contemporary Turkish literature. Now, before I engage with Firat, let me set the context with a brief, and I apologize, somewhat frothy overview of Turkish literature, which is rich, it's timeless, and it is emotionally expressive without descending to uh, hokiness and sentimentality. So here goes the history of modern literature in Turkey in a nutshell. Throughout the centuries, Turkish literature has found itself um, at a crossroads, if you like, juggling between two distinct paths, one being folk tales, folklore, and the other literary intellectual prose. The crucial difference? Language. Folklore is typically shared through the voices of wandering minstrels who have managed to hold on to their unique flavor, have been untouched by the Persian or Arabic influences that have seeped into written Turkish prose over the years. Now, this situation is not specific to Turkey, though. China, Japan, India, Mexico, Brazil, Iran, just to name a few, have all experienced similar challenges in the path of their modern literature. But back to Turkey, their literature really took shape over a period of something like 25 years between 1896 and 1923. 1923, by the way, coincides with the establishment of the Republic, which, of course, celebrated 100 years in 2023. But by 1923, the forward-looking reforms of Kemal Ataturk, women's suffrage being one example, and notably universal literacy. As an aside, today almost 98% of all Turks are literate. The spread of literacy into the rural areas caused new thoughts and ideas to stream into the established literary consciousness, and writers were able to expand their horizons and break boundaries and take their literature literally all over the land. And then world attention came to Turkish literature when Arhan Pamuk was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2006. Now, Pamuk and his literary cohort expanded the Turkish novel's reach into Europe, into North America, markets that matter. The Nobel Prize, undeniably, played a significant role in bringing Turkish literature to the attention of a global audience. It opened doors for translations, for instance. It sparked literary tourism. And it ignited the broader interest in that rich literary heritage of Turkey. And today, Turkish authors are an increasingly common sighting at literature festivals. My guest, Terat Sunil, is a product of this Turkish literary journey. I had the opportunity of a conversation with him, together with the Lithuanian ambassador, Diana mitskabi Chieni, at the Bangalore Literature Festival in 2023. And today, I have the privilege of inviting him here as my guest for a conversation I'm eager to have. So to that end, joining me from his home in New Delhi is the ambassador to India from Turkey, Ferhat Sunil. Welcome to the Literary City. Thank you. Thank you very much. We had a wonderful session at the Bangalore Lit Fest, Ferhat. But uh, did the festival give you everything that you wanted? Yes. So that was really nice. And I remember uh, the interest of Indian uh, audience was so big. There was... Uh, almost uh, 700 people watching our uh, book launch, and I have never uh, uh, had such an interest even in Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> well, what can I say? We like you guys here. Now, I would like to introduce the world of modern Turkish literature to my listeners everywhere. But for me, it's been a fascinating discovery. Now, in the monologue, I skim through the history of uh, this literature, but my questions today will relate more to your relationship with it. This book I read was a great primer for me, A Millennium of Turkish Literature by Thalath Halman. It opens with this line, Turkish literature is among the world's oldest and youngest literatures. Talk about great opening lines. What does it mean, 
oldest and youngest? Yes, let me explain. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Turkish language is one of the uh, ancient languages all over the world. And uh, we have some uh, literature uh, text. Uh, and uh, even uh, when we were still in Central Asia, in uh, now in Mongolia there are some monuments written in Old Turkish. So that's why it is old, one of the oldest ones. But newest, because uh, we have uh, more uh, poems uh, during the history. And, uh, for example, novel and uh, stories, uh, Western-style stories, they are new in our literature. Uh, you know, they entered in Turkish uh, liter uh, literary life uh, in the end of uh, 19th century. That's why it is new and old. We, you know, on the one side, we can uh, have some uh, literary text, uh, hundreds of years old, uh, but in the others, uh, some part of uh, literature is new in our uh, uh, literary life. Yes, let's do that. I'd like to go over two people of significance in modern Turkish literature. And the first is Rafik Halid Karay. Lefit Halid Karay, yes, yes. Journalist and satirist. He called himself the porcupine. Kirpi, right? Uh, Kirpi, yes. Kirpi porcupine. Now, he went by that name when he wrote his columns, didn't he? Anyway, he his work was all about getting real with society, I read. And uh, he spoke up for the disadvantaged, and he was a social engager. But he's really important for literature, wasn't he? Yes, that's yeah. yes, yes, yes. Uh, so Refik Halit Kara, uh, his works are very important, not only uh, from the aspect of literature, but also from the uh, uh, recent history of Turkey, because uh, he uh, was uh, in uh, during uh, Turkish War of Liberation. And then he can compare in his text how the Republic of Turkey was established, uh, in under which conditions. And it is now very important. Thank you very much for uh, mentioning him because uh, we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Republic of Turkey now. And uh, he wrote, uh, you know, uh, lots of things uh, about uh, Turkey, then Turkey, you know, uh, during uh, the, the foundation 100 years ago. And then. After that, he can compare the society, how uh, our society uh, looked uh, like uh, during the war, war of liberation, and then after that. So that's why uh, I really like uh, his works as well. Uh, this is, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, make light for the history as well. Briefly about Kirpi. Now, we shouldn't ignore the porcupine in the room, should we? Uh, I think maybe it's just a sympathetic animal. Uh, but uh, we, we use the, the kirpi word so, uh, for some uh, magazines, but uh, also we have some uh, publishers called kirpi. Uh, it's an uh, it's a, uh, endemic uh, animal uh, in Turkey. And a very useful animal, as a matter of fact. So you know, Turkish people like them. This is a useful animal. So maybe, maybe this is the reason. Yeah. And uh, it, it has also other, uh, uh, you know, specialty. You know, it has uh, some uh, thorns. Uh, when you look at porcupine, a kirpi, uh, it looks very hard, but inside is soft. So, especially for uh, satire works, uh, you know, it makes sense. It can be soft and hard in the same time. That's why maybe they use uh, the, the, the uh, animal porcupine uh, in literature as well. The other writer that I want to talk about is Ahmed Hamdi Tanpinar, and Pamuk once described him as the writer with whom I feel the closest bond. Now, I've read that he pretty much shaped the trajectory of uh, modern Turkish fiction, especially. Yes, yes. He is a very uh, well-known author in Turkey, and uh, he belongs to the same period with Refik Halit Karay. Right. So he was also, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, he uh, was writing his uh, uh, texts, uh, novels, stories, uh, and so on during World War One 
liberation and then later in his works you can also uh, make the comparison between uh, the societies uh, the, the, the condition of societies in world and after world and uh, he's uh, also uh, a diplomat uh, this is also uh, an, another issue uh, he uh, became ambassador later and then uh, from uh, his eyes uh, we can also see the developments in Turkey afterwards how uh, Turkey starts its uh, new in his uh, in her new period after uh, liberation war uh, with revolutions and uh, changes in the society so uh, we can see in his works as well and then another significant social influencing factor was that quick spread of literacy was it Uh, during the uh, first years of the Republic, uh, there was big uh, transformation in the society. Uh, and uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk uh, had uh, uh, carried out so many uh, reforms in order to create a modern society. Uh, and uh, all those reforms uh, were, uh, you know, foundation of the Republic of Turkey. Uh, for example, uh, now the literacy rate in Turkey is uh, about 97%. Uh, It's very high. And because uh, it is uh, because of the uh, revolutions of Atatürk, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. And uh, first time in our region, uh, women uh, get their uh, right to vote. Even before uh, Switzerland or Germany and France, or from uh, before, long before uh, many other Western countries. Now, uh, that was uh, a moment of modernization, a transformation. And that was also a transformation of the society from rural uh, society to urbanizing as well. Uh, during Ottoman time, we had just uh, a couple of big cities like Istanbul, uh, Bursa, Edirne, uh, Izmir, and so on. Uh, but, you know, uh, this is uh, a trend. Uh, it took place not only in Turkey, that's in generally. 100 years ago in India, that was also the case. You, rural area had also more effective. And then uh, the stories maybe uh, also uh, were more common about rural area because that was uh, the um, matter of life, you know, it reflects the society. If your society is more rural, then your literature also reflects the rural life more. Now, nowadays, uh, uh, we have big cities, our, our urbanization uh, process uh, has been completed, and in modern literature, uh, you see lots of uh, uh, examples from uh, city life. Uh, so uh, this is the change. Uh, you mentioned city life, and we cannot not mention Pamuk in this conversation. Yeah, and uh, I, I was fascinated by his book, his memoirs on uh, Istanbul. Uh, which one? Uh, What is the name of the book? Uh, yeah, Memories of a City. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the one about Istanbul, right? Ista yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my uh, you know uh, favorite book of of Ram Pamuk is uh, the Museum of Innocence. It's also uh, it gives you the, the the feeling of nostalgia, and uh, Istanbul in the 70s, in 80s, even uh, you know the life. He reflects so nice. I also uh, recommend you to read this book. It's my favorite book. Uh, I I think I haven't read uh, the book Istanbul. But uh, go ahead, yeah, yeah. He writes about his grandmother at one point, and here's the quote. She seldom left the house after all. Like most people who live comfortably in the city, she had no interest in its monuments, history, or beauties. This, despite the fact that she'd studied to be a history teacher. Now, in much of our Eastern tradition, we really don't give much of a hoot for history, do we? Uh, yeah, uh, it is not uh, uh, like that. We are uh, indifferent uh, for history. But uh, when you live, uh, for example, uh, in a history-rich city or uh, when you uh, read in a nature like a paradise, most of the time uh, you are not aware of this because you get used. Uh, in Turkey, uh, this is uh, at the crossroads of civilization. 
And uh, when you just uh, have a routine uh, daily walk in Istanbul, uh, you see so many monuments, uh, starting from uh, even uh, Roman Empire to Byzantines, from Ottomans. Uh, and uh, when you go and see uh, every day, uh, you get used. Uh, but uh, for a foreigners, for foreign eyes, uh, tourists, when they come, of course, they uh, detect uh, the difference immediately. And uh, this is not only in Istanbul. Uh, when you go by car, for example, from uh, uh, Istanbul to on the, along to Aegean coast to the southern uh, Turkey, uh, you see, you know, sometimes uh, you do not accept, expect to see uh, any old mo monuments in the heart of nature. But suddenly you see an old uh, Roman uh, church or uh, you know tomb and so so this is very us uh, usual in turkey and another thing that seems to be quite usual in uh, turkey is uh, the tendency to be drawn to a larger european expression am i correct we are european we are asian we are from middle east we are we are from balkans we are from caucasian so uh, we are all uh, because of uh, being uh, at the crossroad of cultures. And in turn, what does that mean? Being at the crossroads of cultures means that uh, you can be more observant because you have more to observe? Yes. Y yeah, because this is the difference of being an author. Right. You know, uh, the authors, writers, uh, they uh, just observe the society or the environment uh, from another uh, perspective. Uh, you observe the things different and then uh, you are more sensitive. So this is uh, the difference of Orhan Pamuk, of course. Clearly. Now, speaking of writers, let's speak about you. Now, you're a product of this whole movement Right. For, for where do you fit in in the timeline of this journey? Now I know your fiction is is fantastic. What is your favorite genre that you will focus on? Uh, yes, uh, I uh, write uh, mostly uh, historical fictions. Although uh, I am uh, I belong to the young generation of writers, uh, my novels are mostly during uh, World War II, uh, even uh, starting after World War One. Maybe it's uh, because uh, I like uh, recent history. I read so much about this, and then uh, I find uh, historical texts always very attractive. And clearly it sparks your imagination because your writing is very vivid. It's full of imagery. Clearly, I'm not the only one who felt that. Your book, In the Shade of the Weeping Willows, that was turned into a television series. Yes, uh, that was a TV series, adapted to a TV series, uh, my uh, first novel. Thanks to the TV series, uh, tens of millions of people were able to uh, know about this tragedy uh, described in my book. And uh, many critics, they tell about my works as um, a cinematographic uh, writing style. And they say, uh, we feel like we watch a movie after uh, when we uh, read your uh, books. I'll second that. When I read The Lighthouse Family, the first thing I did, I went to Google, tried to find this location of this place that you described, and uh, looked at the photographs and on-location videos and so on. And, and I want to move there. It's that beautiful. But to be fair, I went to Google because of your description. Now, this writing style, does it come to you naturally? You know, in the course of time, uh, you get this ability. Uh, because uh, every author, they have uh, their own literary style, their own literary tone, uh, and uh, it also changed uh, in the course of time. Uh, so uh, I like playing with words. Uh, I like uh, using emotional uh, expressions. and uh, But, of course, the translation is also very important. Uh, and uh, when I write in Turkish, it's uh, no problem because I can evaluate it's my mother language and uh, I'm a literary person. So, uh, But uh, translating in such emotional words into a foreign language, it really uh, is very uh, important. And uh, my uh, translator, uh, Feza Hovul, I just uh, sent uh, greetings from here. Uh, she could reflect my literary style. 
So that's why I am so glad uh, that foreign critics who read the translation of my book uh, are also very happy, uh, and then they are aware, uh, they are able to pick up my emotional words from the English translation as well. And here's an example of such evocative, powerful prose. On page 88, you speak of the protagonist's brother dying, and you write this line that I want to quote. Drawing his blanket of earth over his head, Ilyas took along all my childhood memories and disappeared into his bed. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, maybe I can tell you also some more about uh, that. Uh, in Turkish language, we have uh, more than 30 expressions uh, explaining the deaths in different ways. Uh, for example, sleeping. Uh, this is a common uh, expression now he sleeps but uh, you know in order to make it softer or uh, another one for example uh, they say my mother became an angel well right. yes so, so evocative take take the line that you uh, read in the beginning in the reading it went like this like all the stone houses watching the sea from the hilltop its doors and windows had been plundered it was blue she mumbled the door was blue, as blue as the sea. Powerful stuff. Seriously, Farhat, I want to go there. You have to. You have to go to the uh, place. Uh, you know uh, the, the uh, abandoned uh, towns, uh, to the uh, lighthouse. They all exist. Uh, you, you you had also a search in uh, Google, you told me. Uh, but this is uh, when you go there and then you see abandoned uh, villages. Uh, you know, uh, people were living there uh, 100 years ago and uh, then nobody is living. Uh, this is, of course, a sad issue. Yes, I can understand why you might call it a sad issue for today. But even at the time that you described the life of the Lighthouse family... There was, there was a certain beautiful bleakness to the whole existence of that family, especially in the life of the young protagonist, the boy, who was a young boy at that point, but you describe his life as an adult going forward. But even during the time that there was the family, it was set during World War II and the horrors of the war. And it was horrible, uh, particularly because this family and that area of uh, Turkey were just innocent bystanders. Yes, this is uh, one of the interesting things uh, in the novel. Uh, you know, the family, the lighthouse family is living in a lighthouse far away from everything, from everywhere and everyone. So this is just a family and the uh, closest village is uh, more than one hour on walk. And uh, three siblings, they play together, they spend the time together because they have nobody else to play with. So that's, uh, they are uh, uh, each other's best friends. And uh, what can happen in a, a lighthouse? Uh, no, uh, you know, uh, uh, attraction, nothing exciting. All days are same. You just uh, watch uh, at the sea and then uh, sometimes you see the uh, ships, uh, boats uh, just uh, sailing around and then that's all. What can you see else? So it is not a very interesting life. It's more uh, boring. You know, uh, they are all bored. But even their life in such a sterilized place, far away from everything, how their life is affected by war. So you see the changes. Even a family not living in a city, nothing to do with the war. And this is not their war. Turkey was not in the Second World War. And uh, you can imagine, if the war, which happened not in Turkey, can affect those people living in the lighthouse, how would it affect the people when they are in the war? Uh, the, the, the way your characters deal with it, I would describe it as stoically. There's a reference in your book to, uh, here's the quote, how right... Epictetus of Hierapolis was, I murmur. Yeah. Epictetus is the uh, Stoicism guy, right? Yes, yes. Uh, well, how was the sentence? Your childhood is your homeland. This is uh, Epictetus. 
uh, he lived in Anatolia in western Turkey. So it's indeed, uh, this is, you know, the whole book is the story is told, the narrator is a, a little boy. And then you see what is happening, the changes and the family life, uh, everything through the eyes of a little boy living in this uh, lighthouse. And then later, this is not just a book uh, when he was a boy, a, a young boy living there. You know, later uh, he had also uh, some other experiences later. Uh, but still, his childhood memories do not leave him. You know, whenever he has something, uh, even a smell, a color, it reminds him his childhood. But this is the reality of life. You know, we all feel like this. And I, our uh, childhood uh, just shape our future, shape our uh, life. If you have a happy childhood, then you will be also a happy person later. And if you have some traumas, then it reflects uh, your life in, in the future as well. So that's why childhood is so important. And uh, I try to give the nostalgia of childhood, this feeling, to everyone. Because almost everyone, whether uh, what kind of childhood you had and so, this is not so important. When, uh, whenever, when you was born or when, where you was born, it's indifferent. The main issue is our childhood memories are all similar even when they are not similar they uh, give the same effect uh, we, uh, t to all of us that's profound so are you working on your next book uh, yes uh, i i have completed a book uh, actually already a novel uh, and uh, now i have to work on it uh, this is uh, the, the name of the book is the ring uh, and uh, this time in my book, uh, I tell uh, some uh, stories from Eastern Africa, uh, where I was posted as ambassador. Interesting. So it's also a multi-layered book. Uh, I tell uh, several stories in one book. Uh -huh. uh, so it's uh, maybe next year uh, I will be able to publish it. And I am also working other, uh, in, uh, on other works as well. So... Uh, Every day I try to write a bit. And sometimes uh, I work on several works in the same time. Uh, but of course, uh, new books will, uh, be, uh, will meet with our readers in the uh, coming years. Well, on my part, I can't wait to read your next book. And uh, maybe we can have you back as a guest once that's published. We say inshallah. Inshallah. I'd love to be there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I look forward to that. On that happy note, Firat Sunel, thank you so much for being my guest today on The Literary City. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. You've been listening to Firat Sunel, author of The Lighthouse Family and the Ambassador from Turkey to India. Now, I have a link in the podcast description to where you can buy a copy of The Lighthouse Family. And if you're a fan of literary things, literary fiction, then you will. And I'll be back with What's That Word? Where we look at words and phrases that we use all the time but never stop to think about. Right after this. I'm back with What's That Word? And my co-host, she's back. Hello. My name is Praniti. But you can call me P. That's P with an A, not another E. Hey, P with an A. First of all, a very happy new year to everyone, to all our guests everywhere. Aren't you going to say something? Happy new year to all our listeners. There you go. A little prompting never hurt. All right. <laughs> all right, P with an A. What do we have on the cards today? I can't believe that we're on season four. Four of the literary city. Yes, and episode 72. Episode 72, with 71 guests, not mm -hmm. 72. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have that one repeat guest. Yes, Akar. Yes, Akar Patel. But given how different his novel writing style is... Compared to what? Compared to his political books. Oh, okay. Right. And? On that count, I'm saying we should count him as another new guest because he's mm. like two different guys. His wife, Toshita, must be really happy about that. <laughs> okay. Things have taken an unexpectedly naughty turn. Well, <laughs> I will ask her this next time I meet Toshita. 
Well, you go ahead and do right that. So, P with an A on this new season four, what's that word? First, what a wonderful conversation with Ambassador Firat Sunil. Thanks. You know, I read the advanced copy of The Lighthouse Family uh, that Penguin had sent us before your session with him at the Bangalore Lit Fest. Hmm. What a story. I mean, I can see why you call it one of the best novels you've read. I did, and it is. Right. So in your live session with him at the Bangalore Lit Fest, Mm -hmm. you took a sly dig at the two ambassadors you were interviewing. You know, you made a sly crack about diplomacy. Oh, what was that? You called how they couch everything in tactful languages, constructive ambiguity. (laughs) (laughs) The crowd loved that. (laughs) Yes, I remember that. Yeah. And someone in the audience asked me the etymology of the word diplomat. (laughs) Do you get this often? Everywhere I go now. And I always tell them, yes, yes, that's a great word. We'll feature it on the next episode of What's That Word? (laughs) You mean like watch this space? (laughs) Yes, exactly. Watch this space. (laughs) Okay. So we know that diplomats are emissaries of their nations to other nations. Mm -hmm. But how and why the word? Uh, Right. That's what we do here. The word, the word is diplomacy or diplomat, right? Yes, it is. Now the etymology, please. All right. It's really quite simple, but also surprising. You see, the word diplomat comes from the word diploma, all right? You mean like a certificate? Exactly like a certificate and means exactly that. You see, the word is fairly recent, late 15th century, early 16th century, it uh, had Greek roots and then Latin roots, and then it went on. But So, diploma, the word in Greek, loosely means a piece of paper folded in two. Now, the roots of that are from diploon, which is the act of folding things over, and diplus, which means to double. And, you know, in the technical knickknacks of etymology, the oma is a suffix forming neuter nouns, and uh, and verbs you know, as a result of verbal action, if you like. So, diploon is the act of folding things. So, diploon, you then diploose it or double it, and then you add an oma, and then the diploma becomes a piece of paper folded in two. Wow. Now, that itself tells me everything. Pretty much. So, these pieces of paper folded in two were described in Latin as a state letter of recommendation given to persons traveling to the provinces. And, you know, it was usually issued by some panjandrum, like a like a magistrate. Right. And I guess this is true in other disciplines as well, right? Quite, quite. Diplomas are issued to doctors and engineers and anyone that needs certification from a, a, a governmental authority was given a diploma. A certificate to practice. Or, in James Bond's case, a license to kill. (laughs) Did he have to show them his diploma before he shot them? (laughs) To the cops, who arrested him later for first-degree murder. (laughs) A get-out-of-jail-free card. (laughs) True. And that would be so funny if it weren't so true. (laughs) Okay, so now to your crack about creative ambiguity. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, you said to the audience that a diplomat is one who can tell you to go to hell and make you look forward to the trip. (laughs) Hey, but I did admit that it's an old one. Yes, you did. And to their credit, the two ambassadors you said that to on stage laughed (laughs) with the audience. (laughs) They did, One was our guest today, Turkish Ambassador Firat Sunel. And who was the other? Uh, They did. Well, Ambassador from Lithuania. Diana uh, Mitskavichiene. Yes, you mentioned that earlier. They were wonderful guests. Yeah. I guess it helps to laugh in these tense situations that diplomats are always exposed to. Of course it is. Humor always helps. And, you know, humor can definitely help paper over a tense situation. You know, it can mm-hmm. encourage people to accept your arguments as well. Um, in the words of the great comedian John Cleese, you know, Monty Python and so many wonderful movies, John Cleese once said, if I can get you to laugh with me, you'll like me better, which makes you more open to my ideas. By laughing, you acknowledge the truth. 
<laughs> that's rich <laughs> and yeah. i sense another coming <laughs> yes well as george bernard shaw put it if you are going to tell people the truth you better make them laugh otherwise they'll kill you <laughs> another sad but true thing isn't it <laughs> <laughs> see tell me does the prefix diplo have anything to do with dipso dipso like drinking like dipsomaniac you mean you want a dipsoma a license to drink you wish mm. <laughs> hey i tried <laughs> and you're off to africa now for a while aren't you as soon as i leave the studio and i'm sure you're looking forward to it i am i mean i've never been there and i am looking forward to meeting some masai tribesmen i mean they look like they're in great shape so wiry and strong i wonder how they do that look in the world there are two sorts of people ones that must run from lions and the <laughs> the others i must run with the lions then <laughs> well you have a great trip thank you so much and i will return with so much culture bye <laughs> And that folks is our show. I'd like to thank my guest Firat Sunil and my co-host Pranati P with an A Madhav and definitely all of you for listening, for supporting us and for coming back for season 4. We promise you a wonderful time ahead this season. Coming up next on the Literary City, the great historian Ramachandra Guha. Subscribe and you'll know when we're going to put up our episode next. Don't miss that one. It's an absolutely great interview. So till we meet again, Have a wonderful wonderful time and again a very happy 2024